Welcome to lecture 14. So in this lecture, we will analyze the priority ceiling protocol, the PCP protocol slightly more. So if we look at it, priority inversions under PCP do reduce as compared to HLP. The reason being that HLP jacks up the priority of a process that has acquired a resource to a very high value, which is equal to the ceiling of the resource. But in PCP, that doesn't happen. So high priority tasks may still suffer because of three kinds of inversions, which are direct inversions, inheritance related inversions and avoidance related inversions, where this category is unique to PCP. So let us now look at some analysis. So assume tasks T1, T2 and T3. So in this case, higher the number, higher the priority. So uh, they have their priorities, so priority highest for T1, lowest for T6. Sorry, I stand corrected. Uh, so here then we're not associating the number is a position. So T1 highest, T2 second highest, T3 third highest and T6 is the last sixth highest. And these are their durations of execution, 5, 2, 8, 4, 1, 5, 8 respectively. Okay, so if you look at direct blocking, T1 can get direct block because of T2 for two units of time, because of T3 for eight units of time, right? Why? Because T1 just arrives and then at that exact point, T2 has acquired a resource and T1 also needs a resource at that time. Similarly, T2 can get direct blocked by T3 because, you know, T3 just acquires a resource and at that point T2 comes, right? Exactly at this point, it needs the resource. So the maximum duration is again eight. Similarly, T3 can get blocked because of T4 for one unit of time, as you can see. T5, since it doesn't need any resource, it will never have direct blocking. And uh, T4 and T6, well, T4 and T6, what you will have is uh, T4 can get blocked because T6 will acquire the resource for eight time units. You can have inheritance related inversion. So, so let us try to explain this number. T2 gets blocked because of T3 for eight uh, time units. So what can happen, right, uh, is like this. That uh, assume T3 has acquired the resource, okay? So T3 just acquires the resource, T1 comes in. It needs the resource but finds that T3 is, has acquired it. So T3 gets T1's priority pretty much, and then T2 comes. So even though uh, T2 can execute on the CPU at least, it will not get access. The reason being that T3 has gotten the priority of T1, and that is why it will continue to monopolize the CPU as well. So this is where T2 needs to wait on T3 for how long? A maximum of eight time units. So using a similar logic, you can actually do it between T5 and T6 for the same uh, idea that uh, T6 comes, then T4 waits on it. T6 executes with the priority of T4 and T5 comes at the same time. It can't execute because suddenly T6 has taken the priority of T4 because of priority inheritance. Now we can have avoidance inversion. So let us try to maybe explain this number here. So T3 can wait for T4 for one time unit, right? T3 waits on T4 for one time unit. So let's go back here. So assume that T4 has acquired resource uh, R2. So then in this case, what is the ceiling of resource R2? It's actually a maximum of the priorities of T3 and T4. So this is nothing but the ceiling is basically the priority of T3. So when T3 comes, it finds that it is not the process. It's not the task to have set the current ceiling. And furthermore, its priority is not greater than uh, the current system ceiling. And it needs access to R1, which is of course free in this case. But it will not get access to R1 because of this 
ceiling issue right so the fact that it is not set the current ceiling and it's not greater than the current ceiling so because of this issue t3 will have to wait for t4 to complete which is one time unit so this will be an avoidance related inversion similarly we can have one more where t4 waits on t6 right and here again the idea is uh, quite similar that t6 acquires r3 whose ceiling is of course a priority of t4 and t4 doesn't need r3 it actually needs r2 but will not get access to r2 even though r2 is free primarily because it has not set the current system ceiling and is not greater than the current system ceiling so now that we have seen these examples what we see is each inversion table here is an upper triangular matrix because we are looking at priority inversions right so everything is pretty much above this line because we are looking at inversions right so t1 will not get inverted by anybody t2 uh, will get inverted only by t1 and so on uh, sorry will get inverted i'm sorry only by the lower priority tasks which are t3 t4 t5 t6 and so on so the maximum inversion that a task can suffer is at best one of a direct inheritance or avoidance related inversions from the blocking rule that we have seen right so from the rule that we have seen it will be at best one of these kind of inversions so therefore the maximum inversion a task will be will suffer is the maximum of the entries of the corresponding row of the inversion table which is that you take any task ti take a look at the ith row of the inversion table find its maximum so the maximum will of course you'll have you have three different tables one for direct inversions one for inheritance inversions one for avoidance related inversions so what we do is that we look at all three rows find the maximum that is the maximum period or the worst case for how long a task can suffer an inversion which we have seen can happen only once so again if we take a look at the same example of course with different resources we can again reason about it so this is an inversion analysis uh it's not for me to do it's for the students to do so i'll skip these and come directly to the liu and lehowski's condition under resource sharing so let the term bi denote the longest time for which a task ti can undergo priority inversions because of resource sharing so which we have said said is we take all three tables take the ith row compute the maximum so ti will meet its first deadline if i add up the inversion time to the execution time and then of course i add up this term which we have been seeing for a while which is again you know flow, uh, floor of pi by pj uh, times cj which is the maximum uh, time that you know other task can Uh, execute higher priority tasks so if this is less than pi where it's assume pi is equal to di then the liu and lehowski's condition is holding right and of course you know in this case uh, t1 has the highest priority then t2 then t3 and tn because their periods also follow the same relationship so the only addition is we are adding the inversion time to the execution time so for dynamic priority systems the priority ceiling values as you can see are changing dynamically with time as and when we are acquiring and releasing resources so each time the priority of a task changes we need to update the priority ceiling of each resource right assuming that uh, it's a dynamic system and uh, uh, the current system ceiling right uh, so so uh, very very you know that priority of a task changes dynamically so the priority ceiling which was pre previously static will now become dynamic so all of these things have to be changed it will increase the overheads of the system so given the fact that this would be an unacceptably high processing overhead this is seldom done right so we use an rms like an organization or an rms like system where tasks by and large remain static 
for a both scheduling simplicity and also it is e much easier to analyze. So if we compare the resource sharing protocols, this is what we So for PIP, the simplest is that it requires minimal support from the OS. So PIP, I'm sorry, stand corrected, is the simplest protocol. Unbounded priority inversion is something that it overcomes because it raises the priority of TL to TH. That's pretty much the only real problem that it overcomes. However, chain blocking and deadlocks are possible, which is why we have the next protocol, which is HLP. HLP requires some support from the OS to maintain ceilings and so on. It solves the chain blocking and deadlock problems, but it introduces a new problem, which is that intermediate priority tasks may suffer from more priority related inversions because the priority is raised to unrealistically high levels. So PCP, we claim, solves everything in the sense it overcomes the shortcomings of PIP. No deadlocks and chain blocking. Reduces the chance of inheritance related inversions as compared to HLP because we don't raise the priority of let's say TL to the ceiling, but instead we raise the priority of TL to TH. So the priority of a task on acquiring a resource per se does not change. It in a sense increases only when somebody is waiting for it. A high priority task requests for the resource, right? Then the priority changes. It's not the case in HLP, you just acquire and your priority becomes massive. That's not the case. So, here, uh, this is a question, so I will not come to it, right? Uh, so, this is for students to answer. So, basically, uh, the highest priority task, of course, does not suffer inversions and under PCP, if a task does not require any resources, well, still, you know, the problem may be that uh, it will undergo priority inversion because, uh, you know, some TL, uh, even, if, even if it doesn't need a resource, the priority of a low priority task could have become high because of resource uh, dependencies and inheritance. So, uh, I'll, I'll skip these quiz questions. So, we finished this lecture now. So, we will now shift gears. We will go from uniprocessor scheduling to multiprocessor scheduling.